comfortably zoned with the zigzag man in Alameda, California, pushing on the doors of life marked pull and fighting the unholy trinity as we go. Big business, organized religion, and government. I am back, and you are comfortably zoned with me, the zigzag man from Alameda, California. All the technical stuff is working today, which uh, even surprises me. Um, I have two very, very interesting guests. We're going to talk a little uh, politics. We may talk a little baseball. Um, first guest is New to Our Airwaves. Um, Jeff Kroll, welcome, my friend. Introduce yourself. What do you do? Um, who are you? You're a friend of Mark, Mark Weiss's. Mark Weiss is off, is here. We know about him. He's a fellow podcaster on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. And, uh, we don't know about Jeff. We know you're well degreed and you're a bright guy and a baseball fan. But tell me a little bit about yourself, and um, I'd love to meet you on the air. Well, I appreciate being invited. Nice meeting you. I okay. am, I am a fiscal conservative, but I guess you could call me a conservative in general. I don't like to call myself a Republican because I do not vote a straight ticket. When I was a kid, I was brought up in a household that was primarily Democratic. And it was about the time that Reagan ran that my dad started voting Republican. And in my adult life, uh, most of the people that I hung out with were conservatives. But I do have a good number of liberal friends. So I see both okay. sides of the um, Where are you from, Jeff? Thank you. I'm from uh, originally born in Los Angeles, grew up in the Valley. But okay. I live in Spokane, Washington, and have since 1977. Okay, and you're there now. What's the weather like in I, Spokane? we gotta got to get the up-to-the-minute. You bet. It's cold. It's about 20 degrees, and it's uh, lightly snowing. I'm actually on oh. my way over to Seattle. Okay. How long is it from Spokane to Seattle, and how dangerous are the roads? How dangerous are the roads? Well, the path, because we have to drive over the cascade, that can be a real pain. They're not treacherous, but you've got to go slow. During the summer, I can make the drive in four hours. It's about 275 miles. Okay. And in the winter, it takes about six hours, maybe six and a half hours to make the same distance. Whoa. Do you have chains and all that? Nope, I'm driving an all-wheel drive. They have not said that the pass needs change. There's an additional pass and if north that I could take, and if I need to, I can always divert to Portland and then go Portland I-5 all the way up to Seattle, but that's six hours out of the way. Okay. We have an idea where you are. We have an idea yep. what your politics are. Contrast that with a fellow by the name of Mark Weiss. How you doing, Mark? Huh? Doing great. Uh, still recovering from uh, spinal surgery uh, last week, but every day gets better and better. So I'm I'm feeling good. I'm definitely glad to to be on the line today to hang out with you two guys, guys who I I just love to hear your opinions because you're both really really smart guys, and you know it makes me feel smart just through osmosis hanging out with you. Uh, don't be silly, Mark. You you're equally smart and. Um more so in my case. I um, understand, Jeff, you're well degreed. Um, can you give me some idea of where you went to school? Well, Mark likes to say that, but uh, if, you, you, if you were to combine all of my college credits, I would probably have the equivalent of a master's degree. I didn't finish my bachelor's, but I have two AAS degrees in particular technical fields. I have an Beautiful. AAS in computer science, specializing in network engineering. I obtained that 20 years ago, and I went back eight years ago and obtained a degree in electronics, specializing in biomedical equipment technology. Basically, if it's a piece of electrical equipment that touches a patient in a hospital, I repair it. 
Ah, okay. Uh, that includes pacemakers and uh, defibs and what whatnot. Defibrillators, yes. Pacemakers, no. Oh, okay. Um, external equipment, right. I guess I should have. Yeah, said. pacemakers. Pacemakers would be internal equipment. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Now, so let's let's get into the meat of stuff. You talked in your introduction a little bit about your dad growing up as a Democrat, being a Democrat, and uh, when Reagan came in, he became a Republican. You know, I was uh, I was kind of apolitical until Reagan came in, and I understood right away that uh, I wasn't apolitical. I had liberal leanings, certainly, but that was back when we weren't as polarized. We're a Democrat and a Republican. Uh, in New York, we had a fellow by the name of Senator Keating when I was growing up, who was a, what they call the moderate um, a moderate Republican. Um, mm-hmm. He was to the le- he was to the left of many Democrats. I considered Kennedy to the right of him, as an example. Um, he was a hawk and whatnot. But I got to tell you something, Jeff. I consider Ronald Reagan one of the most destructive human beings for what. I mean, he killed the, the union, he killed the air air unions, uh, the air traffic controller union, and basically that trickled down, if you'll excuse the expression. And um, huh. unions are dead today, and what he did with the Contras and the, and the craziness, and uh, I mean, Rumsfeld and, and Bush, and he begat all those people and all that. I don't know what what was your dad thinking, and uh, how old were you at this time? And we were uh, you were obviously highly influenced by by it. What was he thinking, and how did you come to just simply go along with that way of thinking and say, "Wait a minute, this is um, it's not for me." I mean, what what was your um, uh, leap of faith, let's put it that way. What was his leap of faith first, and what was your leap of faith to just blindly, as I look at it, go along with that? Wow. I certainly can't uh, speak for my dad exactly. I just know that the change of the times and what Carter had done to the country, my dad he decided there was time for a change. Uh, okay. My mom, my mom was a school teacher, and oh, to answer your question, I'm the same age as Mark. So when Reagan was elected, I was 13 years old. Oh, uh, okay. So, okay. So to give I you a better. Yes, I think I'm probably older than you by a bit then, because I couldn't vote in the first Reagan election, but I voted in '84. Correct, and I couldn't vote in '84. But I vote, the first president I voted for was George Bush Sr. Oh, so geez. that was '88. Yeah. To give you okay. My mom um, was a teacher, and since the '60s, for the most part, as we all know, teachers generally fall into the category of being liberals and/or Democrats. Not saying all of them, but a huge percentage of them are, and especially the ones that I know today. Even if they were, I don't know, call them conservative in high school, they're now what I would consider liberal today by who they vote for and the issues that they support. I think that just goes hand in glove. What brought me to think of Reagan or think of Reagan as a great president, I just was coming into – believing that what Carter was doing was wrong and we needed a change. 13 to 17 is a pretty pretty learning time for a, for a student. Oh, yeah. And one of, of the best teachers I've ever had was a social studies teacher, and he was a staunch conservative, and he turned me on to Reagan. Okay. I can't um, give you a specific item, but uh, – 
I was also in ROTC during the Iran-Contra affair, so I, I understand what was going on. But I was looking at that from a military point of view, and I hold uh, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North as a hero. A lot of people see him as a villain. It's all about well, perspective. I, I, can, it's, I can safely say that we're, we're, you seem to be diametrically opposed to <laughs> Mark's thinking. Um, without, um, without understating it <laughs> too well, much. Well, if you, if you ask me about the, about the, about the, the Iran Contra thing, I, I wasn't a big fan of it. I thought it was probably the lowest point in the Reagan presidency. But of course. I wasn't against the Reagan presidency in any way, shape, shape or form. I, I, I agree with Jeff in the sense that during the Carter years, the, the country really was was in a deep abyss. I mean, I remember that there was runaway hyperinflation. Uh, we were we were bleeding out jobs. We were also in in a, in a place where we were you know losing our, our our prestige internationally, especially when like the Russians went into Afghanistan, and our response was to pull out of the Olympics. And it just seemed to me like that was kind of like the lamest response that I had ever seen to to anything well, like that. Know, I, mean, I think we might have lost our perceive our prestige internationally, and I'm quoting you, when uh, a Democrat named Harry S. Truman dropped a nuclear bomb on Hiroshima. <laughs> we might have lost our prestige when we were founded by slave owners. Um, we might have lost our prestige when we were incredibly unkind to the Native Americans that lived here. Let's just put that lightly. Nationalism, prestige, I think that's all a bunch of crap. We're just, we were founded by imperialists. We were founded by slave owners. Um, we are what we are. It's progressed or regressed, let's just say, to where we are today, where we have a guy. And all, I want to hear what you guys have to say about Trump. I mean, are you happy, Jeff, with, well, with his presidency? I, I can't give you a black or white answer. Well, I can give you a black answer on that. I certainly was never going to vote for Hillary. The people that I, I don't think any of us would have seen. No, we all we were people all. I would have liked. We were Bernie people. We were Bernie people. Bernie was screwed. He, he was screwed by the DNC. The, Absolutely, it was I agree big. 100%. It came out. We do, would have you voted for Trump against Bernie, Jeff? I would have. I would have, yes. See, okay. I, I think it, um, I think it's one step different than that. I think that that you got Trump because of what what the DNC did by anointing Hillary and exactly. by screwing Bernie. I think that's the reason you got Trump, not even in the general election, but even in the Republican side, because the Republicans tried to do the same thing to him, and he was smarter than they were. Not to mention the fact that. He was also the collateral damage of what Hillary and her group was doing because they worked with CNN to make sure that Trump got all the headlines. And none of the other 16 guys got anything, even combined, got anything near him. And so because they did because that – they thought he they, was uh, – He was the easiest to beat in their mind. He right. was the easiest guy to imagine. beat in their mind. So they set him up, they set him up to, to be the Republican nominee – and screw the Republican ticket because that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to make sure that they had the easiest person to beat. They thought they thought they were so smart. And what happened? It blew up in their face. And then they wound up losing to him. And it never should have played out that way. If it played out legitimately, I think it would have been Bernie versus Kasich or or Rubio. I think that's how it would have played out. But the Democrats put in superdelegates to make sure that the people couldn't put another George McGovern in, and the Republicans never did that because they figured, you know what, we always pick the next the – guy, the last guy who lost the last time who came in second gets to be the guy who goes next time, and everyone's always respected that. And they all respected what we, what we call the Reagan rule. The Reagan rule was the 11th commandment, don't attack another Republican, and 
Trump was the only guy who ever did who ever did that, and, the, and it's the first time it ever happened in the primaries. So I think everything I, – I think there's misplaced aggression in this country. I really do. I think that anyone who's protesting against Trump and hates Trump should go, look no further than Hillary Rodham Clinton, Clinton and Debbie, Debbie Wasserman Schultz and CNN and the corrupt DNC – who tried to set up this way of, of getting her in because they knew she couldn't win on her own. I agree with Am you. Am I a little that passionate you. about that? <laughs> um, yes, you no, you're um, exactly what, what you profess to be. Uh, bleeding heart liberal, young man, what's wrong with you? I, I am a centrist. <laughs> I am a centrist. I get attacked by people on both the left and the right. So I know I must be closer to the, close to the mushy middle as possible. Because okay. well, wh- well, while I do like some things that, Trump, that, that Trump's doing, I, I, I want to understand how the one person that is the easiest person to attack on, on his cabinet nominations, which is the, the lady who was, who was nominated for, uh, for, for education. secretary, and she's secretary of education, but, but she's it's the one who's almost going spot. through the easiest. How come, how come the Democrats who want, to, who want to go after the Supreme Court nominee – and went after Rex Tillerson, didn't go after her. And she was been even – there were Republicans who wouldn't even vote for her. Why did they step well, back on that? It's like they were just giving it away. I, that I don't understand because that and the attorney general are the two most important positions. I mean, if you get somebody who has said that she doesn't believe in public education that, um, and you – Put, I don't understand that. I don't understand. I saw that this she, morning. She also said she doesn't Two believe in like, specialized education for people up. with handicaps. When he came, Jeff, when the man dissed the Muslim family who lost their son fighting for this country, when the man made fun of handicapped people, did you say, no, we can't have this guy? Did, did that, as a, as a, cause I'm trying to ask you, as a conservative, did that cross your mind? Does it, when he talks about bringing jobs back and, and eliminating the EPA, which means that some guy in the Midwest, we don't know who he, he is, but some guy will be happy to get a job that came back. And, because of the elimination of the power of the EPA, his company or a company like his will spew shit, garbage, toxic stuff in, in the water, in the rivers, in the air, and his kid will get leukemia as a, as a direct result of this. And that's just a microcosm. That's just one person right there that was so happy to have a job back. And that, nothing wrong with that. But to get a job and sell your soul to the devil, this is a country, this is a, a world that is on the brink of ecological collapse. We cannot do any anything less than what China is doing with our go go ahead. But ship them jobs. It doesn't matter what what happens. They'll get there four dollars an hour rather than twelve dollars an hour, and that's all it amounts to. They don't care what's in the air. They don't realize that what you put in the air in China, the wind blows. If you fuck up with the nuclear stuff in Japan comes right through the ocean and pretty soon species are dying on our coast but but ralph if Why those jobs come back aware here of this i don't understand what's going on but ralph if those jobs come back here and they're not in china even with a lessened regulation for the epa the epa is still going to maintain a tighter regulation on what gets done and produced in this country than over in, in china which is like the old wild wild west where they do okay, everything and anything but they're setting the bar so so low that you're saying that the way it sounds like we're going to do better than they w- would do, and it, it sounds like a plus, but you negate with the with the control set so low, blank, blank, blank. There, are, there have already been low. There, there's been no effort to go to wind and sun power. 
None. And that's in the previous administration. The previous well, that, admi- that's because the previous the administration, administration invested money. But, 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 Ralph, that's because the previous administration invested money in corrupt companies like Solyndra. And Green. then yep. when, when Solyndra was going, was going under, they made sure to make the rules so that the money to their donors who were investees, they got their investors, they got their money back first, and the government, us, the taxpayer, wound up on the hook. So it looked, ter- it looked horrible. It looked terrible. And honestly, I think the, the previous administration, to, to be quite frank, did a lot of window dressing on a lot of things. I don't, I don't think, I don't think they, I don't think they did the things they said they were going to do. I think they did a lot of window dressing on it, and it, it turned into a lot, it turned into a lot of corruption, as far as I'm concerned. And that makes, I think, everyone feel like a hunk of garbage, to be quite honest. Well, I'll tell you, I read an article today that. Um that really scares me most. This is Trump's idea of destroying the Johnson Amendment. And he's talking now to religious leaders and saying that he'd love to destroy that amendment because he wants to let the church leaders politicize from the pulpit. He thinks don't they already do that? He thinks the separation. Don't, don't, of don't religious state. leaders in, in every religion already politicize from the pulpit now? A- absolutely do, or, but they've never been con- yeah. condoned for it, which means that the chances of taxing religion in my lifetime, because I look at Trump as eight years and maybe 20 with his kids. You know, he's got, he's got those two two young strapping hunters. Well, they're, go, not, they're not the heir apparent. Uh, pardon? They're not the heir apparent. If anyone's going to be the heir apparent, it's the genius of the family, which is the daughter. Oh, re- oh okay. Um, she's, the, she's the most favorite child of the group. She's the one who's got all the goods. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, yeah, the sons are going to be just the caretakers of the business. She's the one he's bringing into government already. Her and her her husband Jared Kushner. Who's a Jewish Ralph, fellow? <laughs> um, yep, she's actually Jewish too. She actually converted, and her kids are raised Jewish. She did. Okay, that Ralph, is. I, why I would like to interject having... real quick. Yes. And just while we're on this subject, it's a quick change of topic, but we're talking about the children of Trump. The way that people, the liberals in general in the media, have been going after Barron, it's just reprehensible as far as I'm concerned. I agree totally. I just want to kids are that. Good, Jeff, 100%. Kids Minor are off children limits. are off limits traditionally, but anymore that doesn't seem to matter. N- nobody should have ever attacked the o- the Obama girls or the Bush girls while they were minors, and if anyone did, they should have been in a lot of trouble. Jimmy Carter's kid was fine. Nobody, you know, they they went after Reagan's children, but they were all adults. they were adults. And then it came to Chelsea, and it was hands off with her for the most part. I say kids are hands off completely. I totally agree. Unless they're Sorry, adults. I mean to break Unless they're involved there, in, in the decision. I, I say even if they're adults, as long as they're not politicized. Like for example, like uh, like if 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 Hillary had won, Chelsea would not be off limits because she was an active part of the campaigns. Right. Well, Reagan's but, kids, the the daughter, Re- Reagan, Reagan's kids, guys, but Ron Jr. Ron Jr., you know, he, he threw his, his hat in the ring, metaphorically speaking, that he, he spoke out a lot of things, and he spoke out about on the opposite side of what his father believed a lot of times. Uh, well, didn't, didn't his Reagan's eldest daughter, daughter was completely... A ra- Reagan's daughter was a radical um, uh, she was. Um, liberal Feminist? as well. I, I think she was a little left of Jane Fonda. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just a okay, we can all agree. Just there. Patty, Patty Davis. Davis. There we go. Patty, Patty Davis. Davis. Yes. Um, Guys, remember, I'm driving, so you know this is all off the top of my head. Okay. Well, you have a good head, so we trust you. <laughs> well, right. the fibro fog I, from my fibromyalgia makes me forget things on occasion. Mark knows that. So that's ah. that's true. I, I, I have to say, I'm working with a little bit of a handicap. 
I, I totally agree with you on that, Jeff. I, I'd actually like to ask Ralph a question because he's in the he's sure. in the epicenter of what's going on right now. What do you think about what happened at Cal Berkeley the last couple oh. of days? Wow, absolutely. Um, Be, because I, I, I'm all for free speech and I'm all for protest and I'm all for standing up for whatever you believe in. But when destruction of property and violence comes into the mix and well, the hurting of other say, individuals physically, I, I have a problem with it. There are X number of people there, and as with the um, – any sort of cause always brings out thugs. It always brings out looters. It always brings out attention getters to themselves. And um, – but this one, this one was crazy. This one was uh, – but, you know, you have to give these people a hall pass because all of America is in shock. We have a president – Jeff, I can't disagree with your, your views less. We have somebody who is threatening – to close down what I consider to be one of the most important institutions in this country, and that's Planned Parenthood. And let's get one thing straight. Never, well, at one time, they did, the government, contribute to Planned Parenthood's abortion part of it. One part. They no longer did that, do that. They haven't been for quite a while. So the contributions that the government that they weren't getting from the government will now not only be made up for by the public sector, who is contributing to um, left wing causes, uh, hey, Sierra Club and what have you, bringing in a bunch of bucks to fight it because the government can't. And in essence, you you write it off your income tax, and it's like paying. It's like your contribution goes where you want it to go. So there won't be any trouble. But it's the mindset of wanting to remove the educational and the contraceptive part of Planned Parenthood. They educate women. They educate kids. And they provide contraceptives so abortion isn't an issue. And that's the mindset with, uh, that Trump has to close it down. I don't well, understand that. If you had, I don't uh, understand a humanist who can vote for a man like this, who considers themselves a humanist. I don't understand women voting for this man. I, it boggles the well, mind. Just, well, the board, well, just Planned Parenthood. Nothing else. If you didn't bring the other stuff into it later, but how men treat women. I, I, I actually heard him a million it, times during the campaign say say positive things about Planned Parenthood, except for their, the abortion part of their, of their business, which I've always thought if they're going to do that part of their business, they should spin it off into a separate, into a separate subsidiary that's run differently and not part of what – see – I call it. I look at it as two different things. There's planned parenthood, which is the parts that you were describing, and then there's unplanned parenthood, which is the part that people in Middle America are very upset about. And I think the way you fix that is if you spin yourself into two different entities, and then you're you're separate, one separate from the other. I I think they have to be done that way. Well, Trump's disingenuous campaign rhetoric about it mentioned time and time again that we're not going to have the government pay for abortions. Well, I they could agree with that. Pay for abortions. Pardon me? Well, I could agree you with the government that? should not be paying for something like that. I agree with that, too. And they I, haven't been. I totally agree, too. But, Ralph, I, I need to make clear two things. I was against, and am still always have been, against abortion. Here's the reason. Not because I'm a conservative. I was born and raised a staunch Catholic. I know both of you are a practicing Jew and a Jew by birth, and as you said, even though you consider yourself, what, partially atheistic, Ralph? Right. I don't hold that against you. That's your personal view. Well, I, Not only am I a Catholic, 
I'm also a third degree Knight of Columbus. That said, I, as my feelings and the way I was brought up and being a knight, were against abortion, period. I mean, it's considered murder in the Catholic Church. I understand, but it, but in all practicality, a fetus is not a baby. That's why they put the two separate words in the dictionary. And, True. Um, that's... Uh, but otherwise, it's just the wasting print is not good. There must have been a reason for it. Well, well so I think you're, not killing, you're not killing a, a baby. Pardon. I think Jeff's going to bring up a great point. Killing anything. Pardon me, but Ralph. I, I think Jeff's going to bring up a great point about late, about late term abortions, which is which is not a fetus anymore. Right. A late term abortion on a baby is a baby that can survive outside of the womb. Sure, it may need to be in a hospital but it is self-sustaining with assistance. They don't generally have okay. their life support. I mean, we're talking we're talking late-term abortions to the point of weeks before, days before but the mother. as a Catholic, you're birth. against all abortions, so why? Yes, sir. Just don't offend the late. The, of, come back on the fetus thing and tell me why you're against that before you cloud the issue with late-term Catherine, abortions. Ca- Catholic doctrine teaches that, uh, a, you know, a fetus, conception is considered a, a fetus. A baby is conceived at conception. It is considered once the cell splits, that may not be a scientific, but that, and that's going back to old age, but you guys being Jews also realize that there's things that your religion preaches that by today's standards is somewhat foolish, childish. You know, outdated. I'm not trying to throw it. Well, of course. Outdated, 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 we would, I would say. <laughs> no question. But I will quote the great late George Carlin. It's all bullshit, and it's bad for you. I'll even do it like George did. It's all bullshit, I, I the, and it's bad for you. I think the thing all that bothers it. me about this, this whole topic, to be quite honest, is that a lot of this stuff is like the birth of all of this came from, from Margaret Sanger, who was a blatant racist. I mean, she wanted to use abortion and birth control to hurt, hold down birth rates for people of color in this country, and so it's it was it's all been built on some on on somebody who had ill intent in the first place, and that bothers me in every way, shape, or form, to be quite honest. And as far as uh, you know, when it comes to the the fast rules and regulations of this. I, I don't know. Here's where I'm really mushy, guys. And Jeff will probably beat me up on this because because I'm mushy on this topic. But I I feel like because I'm a man, I don't want to weigh in on what women do with their bodies. I know what my opinion is. And if they asked me what it is, I would tell them, and they probably wouldn't be happy with it. But I don't I don't think that my opinion is is what is significant in 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 this situation because they're the ones having to make the decision and. Roe v. Wade is the law of the land, and I I believe in in respecting the law of the land until it's not the law of the land anymore. And now you both are attack uh, being mushy in the middle. <laughs> I'm gonna su- I'm gonna surprise you. I, despite my personal beliefs and the beliefs that uh, you know the Catholic the Catholic doctrine instilled in me from a young age, I am not one. There are fellow knights that they go out and they go to the, the, the pro-life uh, rallies and hand out literature, I'm not of that belief. If a woman thinks that that's what's needed to be done, that's a decision she's going to have to live with. That's uh, what I agree with. If you were to ask me, I'd give my opinion, but I'm not going to preach to her about it. Now, now, you, now, you see, this is where I want to tie these two subjects together with what happened in – in Berkeley the other day, because there are people who are very much pro-life to the point where they will blow up an abortion clinic and kill people, which is obviously not very pro-life if you're killing people who are living. And just like what we saw, people just doing destruction, burning things down, pepper spraying and beating up people at, at at, at at, at what happened in Berkeley the other day, and that's where you lose me. You just lose me when it becomes uh, you violent. Lose me like that. With people killing abortion doctors. 
Well, but that's that's my point. My point is that that once you step over the line and and destroy property, murder people, injure people, to make your point, you've not made any point. As a matter of fact, you've you've actually taken your point and flushed it down the toilet. As far as I'm concerned, because I don't believe that protest ever should become violent, or you should instill violence where you tell people, let's go blow up the White House. I just it's disrespectful right. and it causes anarchy and and th- and that that from the mushy middle is what annoys me beyond belief because then I can't listen anymore. I I mean the guy that was being attacked in Alameda it turns out is a immigrant who is gay and Jewish and conservative. So and there's a guy with a lot of point exactly. of views with a lot of right. point of views and you know what I find interesting that I want to hear from. I might not agree with anything he says or might agree with some of what he says, but I want to hear what he has to say. Because if I close my ears up and I say I don't want to hear what somebody has to say, then you know what? That's the defeating the purpose of what college was always supposed to be. It's supposed to be a laboratory of debate so you can grow and learn and figure out what's right for you and what's right for the world. But if you can only hear one point of view, that becomes dangerous and you become a fascist yourself when you start beating up people and burning books and destroying people and, and stopping what they say. I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, my wife and I were talking about this the other day. Remember, do you guys remember maybe 20, 25 years ago when the neo-Nazis wanted to protest and rally in Skokie, Illinois, which had like yep. the largest per capita Jewish population in the country? And the first thing that it got to me is say, what a bunch of SOBs going there. I wish they – and then I took a step back and said, wait a second. It's free speech. It's disgusting, but let them do it. And the reason they should do it is because it only exposes them for who they are when they do it. But if we hold them back, we're only fanning the flames and making them more powerful. Okay. You're very well said. Um, Was I I too mushy in the middle again? (laughs) No. No, you're – we all have different – I don't want violence. You know, I think – what do you think of Trump's policy on Iran, for instance? He comes out today, and he's putting more more sanctions on, on Iran, and they asked him point blank, "Would you? does this mean that military uh, actions are off the table? And he says, absolutely not. Well, I don't think he's going to do it, but I think the point is that he wants to leave every option on the table so the Iranians take take what he does seriously. I mean, they violated – what they what they just had an agreement with, and after we gave them all that bribe money, they violated an agreement and and started shooting off uh, missiles, which are de- de- delivery forms for nuclear warheads. And so, not but not only Trump should stand up to them, but the world should stand up to them because they are a rogue regime. And we lift right. the sanctions, and then they go and behave like this. They they are not good right. players. My personal so. opinion on this is. Especially during the Obama years, Iran has been treated with kid gloves. My idea on this is they are the rich bully in high school or junior high that picks on kids all the time, but yet their their father is, you know, upstanding rich guy in the in the community, and he goes in and says something, or the mother comes in and says something, and the principal goes, "All right." And doesn't suspend him, and it goes back, and it, they do it again, and they keep continuing to be talked to, but nothing ever comes from it. And finally, we have someone that has uh, the gravitas, uh, dare I say, the balls to uh, stand up to them, if even standing up to them is what you want to call it, because you know we're the remaining superpower in the world and should be respected, but we certainly aren't at this point in time. And uh, well, how did, it's obvious we that may, we're not the may bad not be guys respected in that situation. because how we became the superpower. And just let's say that you do believe in nationalism and you think this is all very cool and we're going to have somebody that's going step to step up for our beliefs. Did you know that our ally is Saudi Arabia? We have an ally, Saudi Arabia. Has and been for decades. Uh, 
has been for decades. So yep. how could we be respected in the world? I, I mean, we don't respect ourselves. Why are we allies with Saudi Arabia? Why? Because well, of their oil. Persian Perrier. Texas that, Key. That, that is the only reason. We are overlooking some violations in human rights that we can't even watch on TV. If they say, look away when this coming on, we look away, yet we're their allies. We're much more closely in tuned as humans with the Russian people, if not the Russian leaders, than we are with the, the Saudis. And we're not in tune with their that. leaders either. But, but, but this, has been, this is not a right or a left issue with the Saudis. This is something that's gone on since the end of World War II. It's, exactly. it's been through every administration because, you know, money talks it's and BS walks. It's the ultimate walks. sellout because you can judge a culture by how women are treated. And bless their hearts, America, America treats their women better than third world countries and most anywhere in the country in the world and right. um but there are folks that treat their women an awful lot um worsely worsely is that is that a worse i'm from and, brooklyn um, i would say worser <laughs> worser you'd say worser. i'd say worser <laughs> right so um I I can't understand it. I I know it's it's simply a matter of armed dealers, Christian armed armed dealers, selling half their weapons to Arabs and half their weapons to Jews, and all three religions think that there's one little spot in Jerusalem that's just theirs. And truth be known. I think the American philosophy um, is to just let them fight it out. <laughs> you know, let let all the Semites destroy each other. They love to go in and just take over that land again. So um, that's what they're. That's what it's all about, as far as I'm well, concerned. Well, it's, it's actually um, weird because and in, it's, in the it comes Middle down East, to religion been... again, and how polarizing religion is, and how. Um, but, but, you know, but, but it, Ralph, it's, it's not religion versus religion. It's also intra religion. I mean, I don't, I think that, to be quite frank, I think honestly, if you look at the numbers, more Islamic people kill Islamic people than anyone else. Because if you look at the feud between the Sunnis and the Shiites and all the different sects that. within their religion, these, these, fo these folks have been brutalizing each other forever and ever and ever. I mean, that's, the reason why we have this problem with Iran right now, because if you go back to this ill-fated Gulf War, the Iraq War, the first, the, the second Iraq War, where Bush 43 went in and got rid of Saddam Hussein, who I quite honestly felt was pretty much neutered at that point. He was only a local threat, not an international threat. And by doing that, he created a vacuum in the balance of balance of power and turned the Iranians into the biggest player in the market. Instead, Iraq and Iran were always at each other's throat, but it was kind of like a neutralization, and it was a status quo, and that ruined everything. Kissinger Plus, used to had say that. As long, Kissinger used to say that as long as Iran and Iraq are fighting each other, that's what the world we want. has balance. The world has balance. And it did because, because right. they were the two, we were the two biggest Iraq. Yeah. yeah, we neutered and, Iraq, I'm gonna, and and begat ISIS because, you know, we pissed a lot of people off. Um, I, think, I think Jeff had to say something to us. We saw, we, we saw what happened with, with Libya. You know, that Muammar Gaddafi was uh, kind of trying to fly under the radar, and uh, we saw what happened to him, and Assad saw that, and he said, uh-uh, there's no way, guys. I'm not stepping down. He'd rather take his chances with boots on the ground and with Obama. He knew that was never going to happen. That's true, and and Still I think that was actually Hillary Rodham Clinton because she destabilized Libya. Correct. But there again, that's why I, I said if you remember, blame Obama. Jeff, Jeff, if you remember, I said at the beginning of this campaign, I had that T-shirt that said, "No more Clintons and no more Bushes. They've ruined this world enough over the last twenty-five years." I 
Absolutely right. well, agree with that. that I, and ironically, but it's going Bernie and, Mark and, and Ralph and Trump agreed it was the system that need, needed changing, not the We individual. can go back 40 years with Bush Sr. Well, because, because he was in charge of the CIA. People forget he was the head of the CIA. Under he was, and the ambassador to China. Ford. Under Ford, he was the head of the CIA. Yep, and before that, he and was the ambassador I, to China under Nixon. I think it might have been you, Mark, that, uh, that mentioned on Facebook that he was a suspect, or at least it came up in your mind, he might have been a hitman for in the Kennedy assassination. I wonder, if, was that you he, that... He was knee-deep in the, in the CIA at, the, at that time, and Kennedy was the scariest man on the planet to anyone in the status quo because of the fact that he was a rich man with, independent, with an independent mindset, and he made yep. decisions based on what needed to be done and not on any ideology, and they didn't want somebody like that. And they were more frightened of Bobby, and that's why they got rid of Jack, because they figured if they cut off the head, they'd get rid of the rest of the body. And Johnson right. kept him on. And I think Johnson was well, the biggest crook ever. I think Johnson and Hoover were in cahoots to kill him. I don't think it was they were also in, in cahoots to, to neutralize Martin Luther King. Uh, FBI definitely killed Martin Luther King, no question. I, and I think a lot of it had to do with, with LBJ because LBJ was a, de was a deal maker, and he thought by the Civil Rights Act of 1965 that he could wash his hands and everything would be a okay, and 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 Martin Luther King would fall in line and give him everything he wanted. And when he continued to strive for more, he said, "I had enough of this guy." And I know I Hoover would love loved everything that he did. Yeah, I would love. I'm to for every Ralph. I'm for, for everything right Martin the Luther King, except that equality stuff. I, that didn't quite go good with the Dixie Crat. <laughs> so I'd and love that's to a Democrat. do a conspiracy show sometimes. Yeah, well, I've done um, – I, the show I've, I did with my good buddy Scott Gilpin is uh, – who's um, also a political commentator and uh, has been on my airwaves many, many times. We just sat down and went through the minute differences between Democrats and Republicans – and came to the conclusion it's just one big club. It's, it is. They play good guy, bad, bad guy every four years. And um, it, it's just – and what really destroys it is that there's no clear line between church and state. That gets me. And the reason I wanted to talk politics today was that um, that tweet by Trump that says he wants to – destroy the Johnson Amendment and... Let I don't think that would happen. I don't think that can happen because that blows away the whole the whole idea of the 501c3 corporation. I know. Uh, um, I'm for taxing religion. I think if you tax religion, let them compete with the astrologists. Whatever you believe in, it's fine. If, if you start taxing them, eventually they'll go away. The spiritual people will continue. They can, you can be spiritual, and you can be religious. You just don't have to make a business out of it. And I think look at how um, much money the Catholic Church has. They have a oh, lot of money. If you liquidated it, them, what is a property? You could educate the curious. You wouldn't, wouldn't liquidate it, but it would take a chunk out of it. But then also, in the same breath, if we do that, look what look at Scientology. Well, they've they already the eliminated. And we all agree Bible. that would be a good thing. Yeah. That, well, that, that's neat. One religious person cannot talk about another religious, religious person. In other words, mine's, uh, disbanding mine is, is no good, but disbanding Scientology is good. Disband them all is what I'm saying. I, the, I will say there's a, there is a lot of good that comes out of certain property things, too. They own. We're talking about baseball. The Catholic Church owned Yankee Stadium at one time. Wow. Did not know that. Unbelievable amount of wealth. Yeah. And if you go, and I have visited in downtown Oakland, I visited the most beautiful, ornate Catholic Church you can imagine. You walk in there, it is literally 
line, the walls are lined, gilded. It's beautiful. You light, you glow. And you walk around the corner, and there's a family sleeping in a cardboard box. And that's how it is in Mexico. And I, I honestly, I, you're, you're a Knights of Columbus. You're, you have strong beliefs. But it isn't, and to say nothing of, of the child abuse that, that goes on, and goes unreported, and that's going on, on for years. But, but, but I don't but, think that's indigenous to the Catholic Church. It happens in other religions, too. I just think that it got more more publicity because of the cover-up. I mean, you know what they say? It's never the crime. It's the cover-up. I think that's, right. the, that's the reason there was a bigger problem. But I do say, Ralph, that, you know, I understand your point of view, but I did a lot of work with Catholic charities, and they've done incredible things to help people who are poor and down on their luck and especially like kids in like CYO, you know, in poorer areas who might not get to play, you know, they actually get to play sports and stuff like that. So they do, they do a number of good things. I don't don't think we can just blanket, you know, just blanket say that. Well, let me ask you this. Why is it that churches, mosques and synagogues don't open their doors to the homeless? I don't know. Totally. I don't know that they all don't, I, but I don't know why they I wouldn't. No, they, 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 very I few do. Very I have few to interject do. there, Ralph. My mom used to be, after she retired as a teacher, she went back to school, became a counselor, and got her master's in counseling. She worked for Catholic Charities, and she worked with uh, young mothers, basically, that are that have decided, being a Catholic charity, that they would try to convince them not to have an abortion, but they would give the child up for adoption. If those children, and generally they were, I think they were under 18, under 19, if they needed a place to stay, they would take them in. They would make sure that the mother was uh, med- medically taken care of, you know, had housing until the child was born, granted until the child is born, but then they would place the child. So I do know that that – from at least the Catholic faith does that. I'm sure the Jewish do well, too, but I think the I, Catholics are more I'm organized. Just, I'm not, I religion. didn't say Catholic. I said churches, mosques, and synagogue historically right. don't open their doors to the homeless. And if there's anything that Jesus or Moses or anybody w- would have preached, is that you have to give shelter and food to everybody. You have to take care of people. And it's just not being done. Um, Part of the problem today is the fact that everybody expects the government to do it, whereas 100 years ago it was not the government. It was Because government was more hands-off 100, 150 years ago. It was the churches. It was the synagogues. We didn't really have a lot of mosques at that time, but I'm sure they did as well. But it was the churches in general that would support the poor and take care of the homeless. Okay, but it's not being... That's that's actually, that is true. That is true. Well, well, I think that they've uh, ceded ceded ground to the government on that, which isn't a good thing in my, my personal opinion. I, I remember hearing government. stories about about like people in small towns. Like if you were down on your luck, somebody within the congregation would help you and your family out and get you back on your feet, whether it was a job or a lead or whatever the case may be. And it was not. It was like it was like the town's version of a social safety net, but it was done through the congregation. And people felt obligated to the people in the congregation. Hey, Bob got me a job. And, or Bob is like you know helping me so I can get a job. I got to really work my rear end out on this, and I'm not going to sit at home and just collect a check and un, until I find something that makes me 100 percent you know happy. And people answered to other people, and it was kind of a system of community, and that's how they took care of each other. And I think that has gone away completely, where there's really no accountability. Okay. Hey guys, this has been terrific. Um, we're up against it time-wise. We try to keep it about an hour if we can. This way um, we don't put people to right. sleep. <laughs> right, absolutely. Um, Jeff, I really enjoyed having you. I hope you'll come back. And um, next time we'll talk a little ball. Are you a baseball fan? That would be awesome. 
no yaw. Come on, baseball fan. Uh, of course. Yaw. That's, how you, that's how you would mark it on. Um, Mark and I both bleed Dodger blue. Uh, well, uh, I live in Washington State. I'm also a Seattle Mariners fan, and lately that's been a little tough. <laughs> well, Very tough. I can imagine. I did get to meet be. my. Uh, I'll leave you, you on this. Get up to, I did get you to get to Billingham every now and again? Billingham? Uh, I'll yeah. be driving through it later today or tomorrow. Yeah. Well, Billingham is where. I, as the TOPS representative, signed Ken Griffey Jr. They have a minor league team in Billingham, um, or did at the time. Uh, the Seattle um, Mariners did, and I signed him to his TOPS contract in the 80s when he first uh, came into baseball. So um, I love the area. I used to get up there in the summers all the time, and it's um, – it's nice. Um, how'd you become a Dodger fan up there? Oh, well, yeah, you grew yeah, up in I, L.A. I was born in Los Angeles. Yeah. yeah. I remember, Ralph, Spokane was a AAA affiliate. Garvey was my – well, and that, too. Steve Garvey was my That's favorite right. uh, player as a kid. And, uh, yeah, I lived in L.A. till 77. I was 10 years old. Okay. Then I moved up here, and, uh, yeah, until 81 or 82, the Indians were the AAA affiliate of the Dodgers. They were actually the AAA affiliate of the, Do- of the Dodgers from, like, what, the mid-60s? Until, oh, it was like, more the- like the 50s. It was, like, 54, maybe, 57. Uh, but 69, Do- uh, uh, AAA Spokane Indians was considered the greatest AAA team of the 20th century. Tommy Lasorda managed and- them. They had Garvey. Uh, Bill Buckner played for them. Bill Russell played for them. Um, geez, I would say seven or nine of the Dodgers of the 75 through 81 era played for the Indians at that time. Oh, wow. Did you get yeah. the Penguin up there? I think he did play for him at one point. Okay. All right. Well, I know Spokane had a team in the Northwest League at one time as well. They we still the, do. In the 80s and 90s. Yeah, now, so, we're, uh, now we're a single-A ball team. Yes, yes. Um, and we used to be uh, used to be the Bobby Brett used to own it. That's uh, George Brett's younger brother. And that's right. They, they were associated with the Royals at that time, but I believe they are now a farm team for the Texas Rangers. Well, actually, the Bretts owned or had an ownership in um, uh, the um, the M's the. Uh, they played. Boy, I just can't think of the, the city they played in in um, in huh. Oregon for a while. But um, okay. was it Eugene? Eugene, absolutely. The Eugene because M's were the Royals affiliate, and um, Bobby Bobby Brett owned a, a piece of that at one time as well. Bobby Brett still owns the Spokane Chiefs, our local hockey team, who was a very good hockey team. Oh, really? Ah. Yeah. Um, my uh, good buddy in in New York, uh, he's up in Syracuse, and I'm going to mention his name. He'll, he'll love it. Eric Chapman is the greatest minor league hockey fan going. You guys ought to get together on Facebook and, um, and talk because he's got um, – Got a lot to talk about. And if uh, you and Ian ever want to do a hockey show, he'd be a great guest. So um, that's about it for today. I enjoyed having you. I'm going to end the show the way I generally end the the podcast that that I produce. I'm going to ask everybody out there, Jeff, Mark included, to keep your dreams wet keep your humor dry, keep your kids out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics that wear dresses, just to be on the safe side. I know it's this, that, and the other thing, but if you did all that, um, it'd be great. If you did only two of, two of the four, it would be great. If you didn't do any, well, take your best shot. Have a great day. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Thank Ralph. Thank you, Ralph. 
All right. We'll, we'll do it again real soon. Be well. Bye, guys. See ya. Thank you. Bye.